But an underground bunker is not going to prevent you from potentially dealing with the issues that would come to your front door or your underground door. That is very much so aligned with the idea that isolation is what's going to save you in the worst case scenario. If you're isolated, you don't have additional resources and assets, and you need a network of assets to be able to survive. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I apologize for my absence, but I am now a proud tummy ache survivor. And I'm back. So welcome back to Change Agents, an ironclad original, proudly presented by Montana Knife Company. My guest today is a very good friend of mine. His name is Mike Glover. And we're going to be talking about preparedness, survival, and in general, what you can do to prepare yourself and the actions that you can take when everything goes wrong. Mike spent 18 years in the Army as a Green Beret, followed by many years as a contractor for the Central Intelligence Agency. He's an expert in counterterrorism, security, and crisis management operations. He's also the founder of Fieldcraft Survival, a training company offering courses in firearms, survival, mobility, medicine, and preparedness. He's also the author of the book Prepared, a manual for surviving worst-case scenarios, and the host of the Mike Force podcast. And you can check out his new series, Focal Point, which I also co-host with him. Now, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about preparedness. And here are some stats that hopefully raise your eyebrows a little bit. Two-thirds of Americans do not feel fully prepared for a potential natural disaster. 68% of Americans don't have emergency evacuation kits, according to a survey conducted by LendingTree. 73% don't have a generator. And according to a Business Wire study, only 34% of Americans believe that local community organizations are prepared and resourced to assist their community in the wake of an emergency. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves you with taking control over the things that you actually have control over, yourself, your mindset, and your preparation and training. And with that, let's get into this episode with Mike Glover. Hope you enjoy. So we got to start at the beginning, though, of course, I mean, you are the CEO and founder of Fieldcraft Survival. The idea for that obviously came from somewhere. So if you could unpack your background for us a little bit and explain where the idea for the company came from in the first place. Yeah, like many of our veteran friendship group, we all come from veteran experiences in the military. Um, I did uh, about 20 years in the U.S. Army and did a stint in the infantry for four years and then had the standard Green Beret career. I mean, I just did a lot of stuff in the in career in the career field. But I think specifically, as a start point, I started seeking more training that was outside of the protocol of what I would classify a door kicker. I was interested in the technical side, surreptitious entry, I, I was going to every school that I could go to uh, the official cover course, every survival school that was available, I went to peacetime detention, covert comms, and I started learning about, you know, training as a protocol in the find, fix, finish model of the military service. And so I was well-rounded, kind of dotted those eyes and checked those blocks. As I crossed over into the Central Intelligence Agency, I started realizing I had a very much so dependency on the system. I mean, we have protocols to reduce risk and mitigate uh, the worst case scenario. And that kind of leaves us in a place where we're very dependent on the QRF. You know, we're dependent on the, the standard operating procedure or the minimal amount of people that you could have on target. And so when I went to the CIA, I realized there's this whole other world where they accepted risk. And so I was out flapping by myself. So I thought, you know, a Glock 17 in the waistband, if I was lucky, I had a riding partner. Most places I did, but I was in, um, still these kind of semi-permissive environments that could go bad at any time. 
And that's when I started to realize, man, that's how everyday people live. That's how civilians live. And they don't have a protocol to mitigate their risk in their environments based on the threat level. And, you know, what I realized when I when I started mitigating risk and started doing contingency planning and making up for the lack of QRF in a semi-permissive environment, I started realizing, oh, you could be confident in that environment even when you're out there flapping in the world. And so in the civilian uh, sector, when I was coming back home from these rotations, uh, I started to realize as a business protocol, there's nobody teaching that. There's nobody offering that education. And so that's the kickstart to Philcraft Survival. I said, hey, I'm going to do something kind of different, modern survival or modern preparation and fill this gap or this void of, you know, the tactical instructor certainly existed, but there wasn't an overall protocol for how to do all these things in preparedness. So I went to, you know, the basic SEER school, which is, stands for Survival, Escape, Resistance, and Evasion. That was early on. It was post buds, pre first operational SEAL platoon, and it was, it was kind of basic. I would describe it as um, how to survive in a POW type situation. Essentially, the things you can do, that can't do, some strategies for, I'd say more than anything, keeping your brain from breaking. Um, and then high risk SEER uh, after becoming a part of a JSOC command, and I would describe that more as honestly. If I had to break it down, kind of interrogation survival, you know, ways to keep yourself alive. Again, there was the yeah, oh, you need to escape and communicate and all those things, but that was more ways to keep your brain intact when you were in a very high stress interrogation situation. But I never went to any other military survival schools. And even though both of those were called, you know, S standing for survival, they didn't really, I mean, I can't remember any actual survival skills being taught other than very basic map and compass at the first one, maybe some basic fire starting. The advanced schools that you went to, what kind of stuff did they cover? Because those basic SEER courses were basically survive until you're either released or you are recovered by American forces. Yes, SEER um, high risk, which is our version of it, the Army's version of it, is specifically designed for Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the SOAR. 160th guys and guys who are behind enemy lines. So fixed wing pilots that have the highest chance and probability of getting ejected out over uh, bad guy territory. And so our, our specific SEER has a lead up of primitive survival skills uh, where we're teaching basic survival, um, basic evasion tactics and basic counter interrogation tactics to stay in that, that, that loop, stay in that bubble. And, you know, that setting that aside, I didn't really learn a lot from that. But in JSOC, I went to a peacetime detention, our version of the high risk, which was more about, hey, you're in a semi-permissive environment where they pull you into secondary and they start interrogating you and they potentially escalate. They roll you up and they, and they put you in a prison. And how you get through that is based on your ability to basically manipulate the interrogator. So it was very specific to uh, interrogation tactics. The best course that I went to in survival was with the Central Intelligence Agency known as uh, HROC. And HROC is an acronym and it's it's for the case officer that's in, you know, Germany and things happen and potentially it falls and you have to escape and evade. I think one of the first stars and the the legacy of the wall of honor at the central intelligence agency happens to be a case officer who escaped china uh, then burma i believe and was killed eventually in tibet by a random security guard but that whole premise was he was in a safe area it went bad and then he broke contact and he had to survive by being crafty and so the idea of being crafty of surviving with with what's on your person not pre-planned like not not like like we have a plan to escape and evade right now but always being prepared for that is a different kind of mindset and position so it's like the question is like is something happened right now could you escape and evade could you survive 72 hours as a minimum with what you have on person and with all the skill sets that you have that was the best version of it and you know it's a ziploc bag and all the things handed to you which is all the stuff that fits on your person and saying 
can you survive for 72 hours? And we did that. And I was super impressed by that. Uh, lastly, I would say one of the things I was impressed by, which I can't go into too much detail because there is an NDA in place on it, is covert communications, which is a kind of secretive way to communicate in that worst case scenario. And I was really impressed by that whole protocol. Although not exercised often, it's a skill set that you have to sustain. And I was part of that program for a period of time because the chances of singletons and low vis guys, which I was, I was one of those guys at the time of being rolled up, um, is higher in those environments than a direct action environment where you land a helicopter, you do your thing, you get counted on the helicopter and then you fly away. So I, I think it's very relevant to civilians to understand some of those protocols and some of those things that we introduce and to feel craft survival are relevant. Yeah. And I think the biggest difference in everything that you have just described, even for probably the case officers to a degree, like, I mean, we had satellite communication and capability and it's not like it was an actual red button, but if we needed to and called for help, they would move national level assets to stop everything and to try to help people that were isolated. And that's just not available for civilians. I mean, we teach our children to call 911. We don't talk to them about what happens when the 911 circuit board is completely full or how about when you pick up the phone and there's no dial tone. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they are operating, or I should say we had the luxury, probably a not a great word to describe it. We had the luxury though of having those national level assets at our, not discretion, but available to us if things went wrong. And I think that's one of the big gaps in preparedness Personally, when I view how people view preparedness in the civilian world based on how we were trained in the military world as well. I have some stats for you, and I'm curious about what you think about these, because I personally don't think these numbers are correct. So two-thirds of Americans do not feel fully prepared for potential natural disasters. 68% of Americans don't have emergency evacuation kits, according to a survey conducted by LendingTree. 73% do not have generators. Um, according to a business wire study, only 34% of Americans believe that local community organizations are prepared and resourced to assist their community in the wake of emergency. And the same study found that only 47% uh, of Americans have cash on hand. Just 29% have medical supplies of any kind. And only 37% have their medical records on hand. And according to FEMA, just 48% of Americans have created emergency plans. I feel like the actual numbers skew far more towards people being less prepared. Like 73% of people, let's use the generator number. I bet you far less than the 300, well, 360 million Americans, many of those are underage, but let's talk about the adults. I bet you far less than 73% have generators let alone service the generator on a regular interval and actually make sure that the thing works. I mean, there's a difference between having a generator and having a generator full of fuel that hasn't been changed in two years that won't turn over if you pull the crank. Do you get that same assessment based off of your organization, the people that are coming to you? Yeah, for sure. I think I think that paints, just as the statistics read, a grim picture. But like you said, there's there the, the, the details matter. Like, if if a percentage of the population has a preparedness kit, what's in the preparedness kit? You know, is it something? When was the last time they inventoried it? When was the last time that they actually updated the technology of things going into that kit? Yeah, and I, I would say our our country is is ill prepared, and it paints a grim picture. But but really specifically, it points to the level of the lack of confidence in institutions. I mean, this dependency on institutions through social media, we've seen through a pandemic and we've seen through social issues that they're not very reliable. And so you have to bring back some of the dependency and stop depending on everybody else to take care and police yourself up. Um, specifically when it comes to things like uh, emergency preparedness and first aid. Um, if, if an accident happens, if a disaster happens, you have to be able to treat yourself because even in a disaster, like a catastrophe, uh, a tornado, like this tornado that just struck and killed six people in Tennessee, the immediate first responders are overwhelmed because it's a catastrophe. And and you would say, well, that only happens once in a while, but does it? And and when it does happen, yeah, it targets specifically a pointed uh, part of the population. But why would you not be prepared just because you weren't the one that was pointed? If it happened next door, if it happened in the community uh, across the river, 
why would you not be prepared for those things? And so as a, from a company perspective, it is a constant struggle to message to people that we are not crazy, that, that this whole idea of preppers being tinfoil hat guys, yes, yeah, certainly it exists, but I live in a neighborhood in the middle of Provo, Utah. I mean, I, I could see the town from my position here and I'm assimilated. I'm not living radical, but I'm more prepared because it's on my mind. It's deliberate processes. It's things that I train and I equip myself for. So trying to say that is difficult because of all the stigmas and stereotypes associated with preppers, but it's something that we've accepted the challenge for. And we we bridged a lot of gaps. I mean, uh, Andy, to give you an example, um, for example, on first day, tourniquets. When I started talking about tourniquets a decade ago, I was attacked by the medical industry in space, even people that I knew that were 18 Deltas, SF medics, because they were saying, why would you teach somebody how to do that? Like they should be taking TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care, or getting their EMT or paramedic certification. And I said, listen, guys, like all this information is now available. If you could build together a hybrid Tesla um, in your garage from a YouTube video, why would I not educate somebody to apply a tourniquet, which is a piece of material to stop the bleed? Because it only takes a few minutes to do that. And it's not special. It's not classified. Yeah. And it's pertinent information for civilians. And so over the past decade, say about seven, eight years ago, nobody was selling tourniquets to civilians. It was exclusively a military line item and, and it had an NSN associated with it. Now we are selling those. And I, I would say, um, based on the statistics that I've read, we sell more tourniquets to civilians than any other company in the country. And that's a good sign and indication that people are paying attention and realizing it's relevant for them. You know, it's interesting you bring up uh, preppers, which I often think, and you know, I've had this conversation. How do you explain preparation? Because first you have to kind of like breach the door and get through the tinfoil hat, like red dawn, Soviets are coming. I sleep in my buried school bus that has an air filter and I have water for six hours. You know, it's it's not, some of the, the negative associations with that. What are some other common misconceptions that you have or stereotypes that you've encountered around the preparation space, not the prepper space, but the preparation space. Um, one of them is to be most prepared. You have to be isolated and, and typically hmm. underground. Um, I, I once did a post, which I got highly suppressed on social media because of that. I actually <laughs> lost my account because of it. Cause I said, I showed a picture of an underground bunker and I said, I could kill you with a garden hose. And, and, and what I was saying was, you know, I could literally just put a garden hose in that underground bunker and wash you out. Underground bunkers come from a very Cold War specific time in our history. But an underground bunker is not going to prevent you from potentially dealing with the issues that would come to your front door or your underground door. Um, like, for example, people exploiting your potential weakness. We know in civil unrest, we know in riots, we know when things hit the fan, people come out of the woodwork and they do evil things and and they try to exploit your your weakness and and, and that is a very uh, uh that is very much so aligned with the idea that isolation is what's going to save you in the worst case scenario if you're isolated you don't have additional resources resources and assets and you need a network of assets to be able to survive because you can't pull security grow the food take care of your family and do all the things at the same time. So when you divide and conquer, when you have actually a pool or a tribe of people that are collectively skilled and they become assets weighed over liability, then you increase your chances of survival. It's why tribes or groups of people survive versus the individuals that you think are going to survive. Now there's a scarcity resource and famine kind of association with that. Um, but again, you can't do it all. And and this idea of getting the cabin on the side of the, the hill in the middle of the mountains, that's not going to work. Yeah, and I, I would consider that to be like the edge case, people who legitimately – and there are a community of people out there that have those type of bunkers. Like that is legitimately part of their plan. So like I said, I'll call that an edge case. Coming back to the other side from just – from a preparedness mindset – Give me your top three or five or whatever sticks out in the top of your head. Items, 
tools, technology that you think that people should start with when it comes to just general preparedness, like um, everyday life, not not people who own bunkers? Yeah, that's that's a good good question because it's the it's a tangible component of this, which is important. Um, philosophically, preparedness is talked about a lot, but nobody's really talking about how I do it. Um, the first thing I would say is have a conversation with the people that you love and navigate what your priorities are. You know, a person's priority in a neighborhood in Provo, Utah, is very different than a person's priorities in Key West, Florida or, or Kalispell, Montana. The environmental conditions and factors uh, weigh heavily in how you're preparing and, and also your priorities in life. I mean, a, a lot of people weigh, for example, tactical training over physical fitness. Uh, it's not the way you do it. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we, we started doing jujitsu is because um, as a foundation, me and you grew up in a combatist world where uh, part of your common core skill sets were physical training, including combatives, and you had to be prepared at the base level before you started advancing to tools like the M4, the sniper rifle, et cetera. So... Um, having the conversation will identify weakness most importantly. Because if you say to your spouse, hey, honey, um, we don't have a fire plan. Where do we go from here? It's like, oh, well, we got a lot of gaps to fill. Like we need to be prepared for the oil fire in the kitchen, the, the house fire upstairs. Um, secondly, I would say most people don't think about first aid and they should. Statistically, you're more likely to be in a vehicle accident and potentially be injured than nearly anything else besides cardiovascular disease or fentanyl overdose. So if you look at 17 million accidents that happen a year, you look about 2 million that people are injured, 1 million people live catastrophically with those injuries the rest of their life, and about 40,000 people die a year. It's like, oh, crap, I ought to be prepared for that. But not just prepared for myself because those statistics are high. If you weigh just your common interactions with your exposure to the miles you put on the highway, you're going to come across people who are potentially injured and you need to be prepared as a responsible citizen. So first aid, especially stopping the bleed is a priority. Um, I would also say in waste security, but not just the EDC pistol in the waistband. I mean, we default to, to that. I certainly carry, I got a 365X macro in my, my waistband now. It's something that is part of my everyday routine. But I also mean mitigating the potential risk to you and your family smartly, like with technology. My entire house is rigged with technology that allows me to see it coming. And so the early warning, um, the, the sensor, and these are not like uh, things that I'm soldering together in my basement. These are things, <laughs> <laughs> this is a it'd thing. Be awesome if it, it'd be awesome if they were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but these are things that you, you, I bought at Costco, you know? Yeah. And so um, being able to secure, secure your and your family is important. Like uh, during personal defense, we offer this course that me and you have taught together in Montana, when we teach that course, you know, we do a scenario where it's like, you're at a gas, gas station at two in the morning. You know how to reduce that risk? Don't be at a gas station at two in the morning. And so um, th that's very important tangibly to approach all the things that you do in your life, um, including personal security, including training. And lastly, I know there's a lot more to this, but lastly, I would say, um, pay attention. Situational awareness, That those statistics I gave in accidents are mostly associated with distraction and driving, but mostly associated with your cell phone. It could be eating a meal out of your lap, putting your makeup on in the mirror. Um, but distractions are typically what hurts us the most in our environment. So pay attention, put the cell phone down and maintain situational awareness. Situational awareness is a very deliberate protocol, but it's not complex. It's not a military protocol. It's just simply paying attention to your environment and what's taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not be more fired up to introduce the presenting sponsor for season two of Change Agents, Montana Knife Company, founded by somebody that I feel very fortunate to call a personal friend, Master Bladesmith, Josh Smith. Not only a Master Bladesmith, but the youngest Master Bladesmith and one of the most experienced in the world. Montana Knife Company blades are some of the finest that I've ever been able to get my hands on. They are the sharpest knife out of the box, and they're some of the easiest to resharpen when you dull the blade. I take them everywhere that I go. I have them in every vehicle that I own and every backpack that I ever take into the backcountry. Specifically, my favorite blade of theirs is the Speed Go. It's lightweight, but so incredibly capable. I never leave home without it. If you're familiar with Montana Knife Company, 
you know it is often very difficult to get one of their blades because they sell out within minutes of being released. What you should be able to find in stock are the Blackfoot 2.0, Speed Goat, or a Stonewall Skinner. And if you use the code CHANGEAGENTS10, that's going to net you 10% off of your first order. Again, my personal favorite blade is the Speed Goat. If they have them in stock right now, don't mess around. Put it in your cart and complete the checkout. Montana Knife Company, they build working knives for working people. And like I said at the beginning, I could not be more proud to collaborate with them on Change Agents Season 2. There's a lot of things I like about the Mountain Tough program, but I think primarily what I enjoy is they focus on mental toughness in addition to just the physical toughness. Everything they do is grounded in one purpose, life transformations and being strong between the years in the mind. And there's also a community of 15,000 plus Mountain Tough athletes. So the community is strong, they're supportive, and they're gonna help keep you accountable. So you can train anywhere, you can stream anywhere. You can access guided training and on-demand workouts right from your phone, your tablet, or TV or computer, whatever you're into. And everything you need is in one spot. The Mountain Tough subscription gets you access to all the Mountain Tough programs, new programs, and bonus content. And they have programs for everyone. Those who hit the gym and heavy weights, those who like to work out at home with no gear or minimal gear, and everything in between. Mountain Tough has been the trusted training by the dedicated for years now including U.S. military special forces and dedicated backcountry hunters. There is no excuse for you to not start today. With Mountain Tough, you can conquer your goals with the ideal program for your lifestyle and schedule. Train with equipment or just your body weight on your phone, tablet, TV, or web browser. Most importantly, they will help you train your mindset so you are always ready for anything that life throws away. Mountain Tough subscribers get full access to world-class home and gym programs, groundbreaking mental toughness training, self-improvement, prehab and rehab, biomechanical form coaching, stretching and mobility flows, nutrition guidance, challenge workouts, and the global Mountain Tough community. Mountain Tough is offering Change Agents listeners an incredible offer. You're gonna get 40% off on the all new Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription with the code CHANGEAGENTS. Go to mtntough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to receive 40% off, a savings of about $100 on your Mountain Tough Plus annual subscription. That is mtn, Mike Tango November, tough.com and enter the code CHANGEAGENTS to save 40%. That is less than 50 cents per day for the best in-class physical and mental training. It's funny to me the focus when it comes to EDC on the things that make holes versus the focus on the things that plug holes. And from a, and I, you know, statistics can be modeled to kind of prove points if you want to, but even in my own life, post-military, I have been a first responder on accident scenes multiple times at this point, And you are so much more likely to be needed in a life saving capacity than you are in a life taking capacity. And I, I believe both tools, I'm not even going to weigh the ratio. I think they're both essential, but it is, it's kind of shocking to see how much emphasis is put on the lethal tools versus the life-saving ones. And I think that's an easy step that people can make. I was going through my vehicle the other day. I mean, before I wrecked the Bronco, which is now at your HQ, we were talking about all the stuff that was in there. But I'm driving my truck, and I opened up the glove box, and seven tourniquets fell out. <laughs> because one is none, two is one, and seven is better than all of those things, apparently. But those are the things that I have used post-military career. I have applied a tourniquet. When I long ago, actually, I was still in the military. When a guy tried to, for whatever reason, cut his arm off with a bandsaw, one of my neighbors, I threw a tourniquet on there. I was getting ready to throw an IV in. And when the paramedics showed up, they looked at me like I was from space. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. This is what we're kind of been taught how to do. Never, I mean, thankfully, never had to shoot anybody in the US and I don't want to, but I do want to be a value add in whatever situation that I am in. And the stats largely favor life saving over life taking, for sure, kind of like you mentioned. Um, another situation that is statistically anomalous for people to encounter, and I know you've done so many videos on this on the, uh, the Mike Force page or just even on your YouTube channel, and it's something that I know people worry about, and it's active shooters. How would you recommend that people prepare for or even act 
if they encounter an active shooter situation? I know there are so many variables from distance to what they may have on them from an EDC perspective, but what would be your overarching um, perspective on that? Well, let me give you an interesting statistic since we were talking about first aid to bridge this. Um, I was pretty alarmed by this, and you might even be alarmed by this. I don't think I've told you this before. Um, a, a surgeon once told me in the United States, and this is very recently, that 90 plus percent of active shooting victims are shot in the torso, not the extremity. And and I, hmm. I had to take a step back because I've been teaching extremity, extremity stopping of the bleed forever. Yeah. Because in combat, we do a lot of that. And the reason we do a lot of that is because we, we wear body armor. So you take a couple on the plate, you take a couple on the arm, and then you have to manage that bleed. But civilians don't wear body armor. And likely because the active shooter is is moving very rapidly, potentially under stress, they're just shooting center mass. And when they do that, they're putting rounds in the upper torso, which is a co- which, which is causing several issues, including bleeding in the chest, attention to pneumothorax, so on and so forth. Yeah. Everybody will carry a tourniquet, but very few people will carry a chest seal or know the protocol how to needle decompress. I mean, the first time I needle decompress somebody wasn't in combat, was actually on the streets of Fayetteville, North Carolina, when I was behind a buddy who got in a vehicle accident and I had to put a chest seal on him and then needle decompress him in the middle of the street. Uh, I would say um, there's definitely a protocol and first aid on person to make sure you manage your stopping of the bleed. But understanding an active shooting is is likely to be a mass casualty event. Outside of that, we have our own protocol for for active shooter, which is very different than the government protocol. The government protocol is run, hide, fight. We know how run, hide, fight, for example, worked at Virginia Tech in 2011 when 30 plus people were killed in that school by one shooter. With And I want to add to that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you're about to say it, and I want to add to that, that was by two pistols. I believe one was a twenty two and one was a 9 millimeter. And oftentimes, if not most of the time, people use an active situation to bring into the conversation an AR platform type rifle, which stands for Armalite rifle, not assault rifle for people's edification. The most catastrophic mass shooting we've ever had in this country was by pistols. And I think that's important for people to remember. Yeah, that's super important because it, it had um, little to do with a particular platform and more to do with the psychology and the tactics that were utilized by the shooter whose, whose name was Sam Cho. Now, when he went into the school, the first thing he did is he locked the doors with chains and locks and prevented anybody from escaping. If they followed the protocol, which I, I'm uh, uh, based on the information that I've read on the case study, very in-depth, um, I, I'm one to believe that the teachers enacted the protocol, which was run, hide, fight. When they did so, they had nowhere to run. So we checked that block. Where are they hiding? Anybody who hides doesn't hide in a position to fight. They hide in a position to hide. So they're getting small. They're getting underneath things, which prevents them from being able to react appropriately to potentially fight for their life. 90 plus percent of the people who were shot and killed were shot in the head while they were cowering in fear uh, hovering uh, their hands over their head in some capacity and were shot. Uh, his his SOP was to walk into a room, shoot each and every individual student that was hiding underneath their desk. Then he walked into the hallway, reloaded, and then he repeated the process. That whole entire deal for him um, didn't take a lot of time before he killed himself, before the SWAT entered the, the, the actual room. And it's very unfortunate. But when you look at that protocol, just like we understand emergency procedures where protocols like that come from, we are trying to reduce the amount of time it takes for somebody to cognitively process information. And we want them to react just like a fighter pilot doesn't have time to think things over and go through analysis. He has to react based on the symptoms. So if we, if we just take that for a second, when you're running, what direction are you running? Have we put in any information that, um, we're, we're, we have a protocol for where to run. When we hide, where are you hiding? When you fight, how are you fighting? So in our in our acronym, it's observe, fight, and flee, or flee and fight inversely. And the reason that is is because you have to assess important information. When you observe and you're taking in information, it's like, oh, he's down the hallway on the right. So obviously, I need to, as a protocol, flee, but I need to go the opposite potential direction because the further I am off the X, the, the more likely I am to survive. Um, in the flee and flight capacity, I need to always be moving. I don't need to 
you know, curiosity killed the cat. I don't need to be investigating what's going on. I needed to be be displacing. Most of the students of Virginia Tech that survived did so because their teacher allowed them to escape through the window. They crashed mm-hmm. through the window and they were jumping down even from the second story of that particular floor. And, and that's what allowed them to survive by getting away from the situation. And those that fought were actually at a higher rate of survival than those that didn't. Because those that fought, despite some of them dying and, and, and getting shot through the door even and paying with their life, a teacher uh, who was a, a uh, World War II veteran, a, a young man who was pushing the door and preventing them from entering, certainly prevented life, but they paid for it with their own lives, but they died fighting. Anybody who didn't fight and who was hiding certainly perished. So having a protocol to fight, what does that mean? What well, means when I'm hiding – if I, if I get into a position to hide, maybe I'm not necessarily putting my hands over my head and getting underneath a desk or in a closet. Maybe I am positioning myself to potentially fight. Now, this is a two-hour podcast that I've done before on the education of this. We're just talking kind of high level. There's yeah. certain principles that we have to follow, but I, I think run, hide, fight as a protocol is a very poor protocol. Do you know who actually created that particular protocol, the run, hide, fight? Uh, it was a government study. I don't know the particular person that did it, but it was a government study that was done on active shooting. And and generally speaking, it was law enforcement agencies and buy-in with government uh, um, um, uh, approval processes that allowed that protocol to become what it is. Interesting. Yeah, no, so, I mean, I guess this next question, it, it was an active shooter situation for sure. You know, it's a real time study in violent events. You look at what has happened uh, previously or what is ongoing in Israel and let's shelve the conversation that would be hours long of, you know, the politics involved in that and who did what and why did what. And and again, all of those things should be and have been and should continue to be wildly unpacked. Um, But let's just view this through the lens of armed terrorists taking over neighborhoods. What, when you watch that situation, what are your takeaways about preparedness and awareness and vigilance in violent situations? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the the tragedy that happened on October 7th in Israel had a lot to do with protocol. It had a lot to do with culture. And you look at, you look at Israel and they have a mandatory service obligation for every single civilian that is born and raised in Israel. They have to serve in the Israeli defense force in some capacity. When you, when you look at that protocol, um, it's a very good protocol for a fairly low population of people surrounded by a lot of people that hate them and want to see their demise. But if they're not equipped, but they're trained, then there's a gap. I mean, the gap is like you could have all the mindset in the world. You could be a, a warrior in your mind. If you don't have the tools when confronted, then it's all for nothing. So I, I think... One of the things that was sad was there were plenty of people who were willing to fight. In fact, there were many stories of people who displaced and then came back into the fight. Some of them unarmed. They used their vehicle and they tried to get people off the X, including their own family members. But if they were armed and and they were responsibly armed because they were trained as a protocol in the IDF, they would have had a fighting chance. And and you know, you look at that kind of thing that happened. And, and on October 6th, you would say that would never happen. Um, Israel, supposedly for a year, knew in advance that that threat was potential. But, you know, like people try to narrowly point to that as as some kind of conspiracy. It's like we're, we always know there's a threat coming. We, we, we got fire bases, uh, had fire bases in the middle of nowhere. where We got the call in the middle of the night said, hey, this is an intel officer from whatever agency. Uh, you, you guys have an impending attack. Hang up the phone. And then after about the 10th time, you're like, yeah, OK, well. I, I guess that's always a thing, right? So if they were prepared with the equipment and they had a plan and protocol and emergency preparedness as a community, they would have been more prepared. Um, outside of the institutional preparedness, which is lackluster to say the be- say the best or to say the least, if you say if you look at the situation where um, you know a three, six, nine hour drive, depending on where you're located and where you were attacked, that response time should have set and established a specific protocol in the specific community because of that. If there's only five security guards from the IDF that are policing up my community, 
I need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Often because of complacency, we're prepared for the best case scenario. So prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And and in this case, um, there are a lot of things that they can repair. Uh, I think based on this, the uh, information that I've taken in, I, I don't think they'll ever make that mistake again. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, for me, one of the main things that highlights in these situations as well, it seemed as if to a degree, there was a level of shock and awe on is- Israel's side that this was happening. And it just speaks to how important your velocity is in your reaction, how making decisions quickly and then acting on them. It's not like, is it like you, like you mentioned, you could have the, you could be a warrior and you bring fists to a gunfight. I hate to tell you how that's likely going to work out, especially at distance. If you need to cover the distance of a rifle, I mean, good luck with that. But the velocity that you make those decisions can truly impact how egregious these uh, that, that particular catastrophe or ones like it can be, at least in my opinion. So worst case scenarios, I feel like this question is like what you daydream about all day long. So there's a new Netflix movie. It's called Leave the World Behind. Have you seen it? I have. Yes, it's great. OK, so perfect. Exactly. I knew that you were like, yes, I have my morning coffee and think about this. So for those who haven't seen it, which includes myself, but. That'll change rapidly. It depicts a scenario where a massive cyber attack knocks out power in telecommunications, sparking widespread civil unrest. Looking at that through the lens of somebody who lives in the U.S., how vulnerable do you think that we are in the U.S. to this type of attack? And then added to that, what do you think people should do in a situation where comms and electricity are taken offline? Yeah, this is my favorite question by far. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So... So yeah, leave the world behind is a, is a great depiction of the potential. And I think we're closer to that than we've ever been in history because the advancement of technology to include AI, but power grids, the list goes on. A study was done on power grids in the United States. Um, and this study proposed that the 4,000 plus power grid locations that primarily feed and network the country to electricity, there's about a dozen that have hit would shut down electricity for up to a year in the United States. This happens all over the country, and we see what happens in just a 24-hour period. When we lose power in Buffalo, New York, or New York City, or San Diego, California, just for a short period of time, all these characteristic things that take place are what we would see on a grand scale with more time that went by. Um, We see exploitation of, of, of people. We see... Uh, the abuse of powers. We see um, people pillaging and and stealing and violently attacking. We see all the things that take place. Here's my concern. With technology, we've bought into the idea that it's bringing us more efficiency and uh, further optimizing our life in the future. That is creating less dependency on our own self-reliance and more dependency on a, a government institution, a a building, and a government protocol. Uh, when you hear uh, politicians say we should adopt a power grid nationally that allows us to turn off the garage lights in your home to save power if you left your garage lights on, that's scary because we're creating more dependency on and more weakness that could be compromised and exploited. Like when, when this, this Chinese balloon came across the country, I wasn't thinking – This is a spy balloon. I was thinking this is an ops test. This is certainly an operations test to evaluate the security protocols because when we were testing in the 50s and 60s, nuclear explosive devices that were detonated in our atmosphere or upper atmosphere, we were testing electromagnetic pulse. And so that that proved to be a very telling story of the potential threat that lied. That's why after that test, nothing was talked about in that in that field um it's <laughs> like they literally just stopped all the testing they're like oh my god and and there's there's proof and evidence that this was so dramatic of a of a thing because everything was classified post that explosion so i think we're in a situation now where we are tethered too much to technology i mean the hydroelectric dam that feeds electricity to my house right now if that thing was compromised it would shut down all the power and there will be no contingency in place. There's no other power grid to plug in. We don't, there's not solar p- panels tethered to the, the neighborhood that I'm living in. So what would I do? 
I mean, the food in my fridge would expire in a couple of days. Um, I would have no ability for running water. I would have no ability as a sewage system. Um, I would have no ability outside of my, the gas that's in my vehicle to even fill up my tank at the local gas station because it's a power pump tethered to electricity. I, I think this is this is what the world sees. And when you look at when you look at a crisis and catastrophe on a grand scale, it's a couple foreign powers, maybe even just one realizing which they already realized their, their foreign uh, intelligence services already realized this a long time ago that the way that they take down america is by further making our systems dependent on, on the system taking away self-reliance and then shutting it down nearly just flipping the lights off and what will happen when you turn off the lights all the cockroaches will come out and it will be complete utter chaos we see it in civil unrest we see it in, in 24 hour cycle power outages. I can't imagine if the grid was shut down for an indefinite period of time. Yeah, that uh, I'm trying to think the quote if something like we're nine meals away from anarchy at any given time, something like that. If something truly catastrophic happened, you know, nine meals, obviously three meals a day, depending on who you are. Sometimes I eat nine in a day. So maybe that's one day for me, <laughs> three days for others. But that's how far away we are from just basically true anarchy, which is. That's a rough one. Um, and we haven't even really talked about natural disasters yet. And I know you did a video um, on this, but in 2022, there was a blizzard, and I believe it was on the East Coast, and it stranded hundreds of motorists. And I believe you did a video specifically, I think it was a woman who was maybe 400 yards from her house, something like that, but got trapped in her car. I believe she expired. Um, and my reason for bringing this up is, most people travel throughout the course of their day to go to their job. You know, COVID was a little bit weird, some remote work type stuff. But a lot of people are based in their vehicle for a good period of time throughout the day. What do you recommend people have in their vehicle? Yeah, good question. I, I think in that case, you know, it was a freak winter storm. But aren't all these catastrophes freak something? I mean, aren't, aren't, oh, they, sure. aren't they seemingly reported as anomalies, but they seem to be happening more often? Or is it they've always happened and they're just being reported on and talked about more often? I think that's that's more the case. So uh, you know, when it comes to vehicle preparedness, mobility preparedness, you know, we've been we've been doing a lot more mobility trips together. We got some um, plan in the future in 2024. The, the thing I tell people all the time is, if you plan for recreation, especially you know having fun and recreating in the back country of America, you're likely preparing for the worst case scenario. And, and so, what do I mean by that? Well. If you're detached from um, infrastructure, if you're you know 200 miles from a gas station, if you're two hours from first response, then you have to fill the gap with your own protocols. Some of those will be communication, for example. Um, you're not going to have cell phone reception in the backcountry. So what should you have? Well, me and you, the other day when we were with Origin jumping, uh, you were jumping out of helicopters and I was managing the drop zone, we were communicating via text on in-reach devices which use SAT-based communications tethered through a cell phone network in order for us to be able to communicate. And that's foolproof pretty much with power. Um, and, and that could be even, even solar power for the small electronic devices that we have. That's a great means of communication because the satellites will continue to rotate around our orbit in space when the cell phone infrastructure and power grid goes down. So communications is important as a priority I would have as as a pace plan, primary, alternate, and contingency will cover. The primary should be your cell phone. The alternate should be SAT Iridium-based communication. And the contingency should be any RF-based communications to include GMRS or ham radio. And it, it's a little complicated, but um it, it's one Googleable step away before Googleable, you know, shuts down, your Googleable tactics shut down. So reference that and have that communications. Most people die in backcountry open exposure type events from hypothermia. And that girl actually died from not hypothermia. She died from carbon monoxide poisoning because mm. uh, her the snow level went up to her exhaust. She was using the heater smartly in her vehicle, the insulation, which is mild at best, and the heater to keep herself warm. She died. It happens, but most people die in backcountry from hypothermia because they get exposed to the elements, have a Mylar space blanket, have a Mylar bivy sack, have a sleeping bag in the trunk that's a void where you don't have anything uh, back there anyway. Have it uh, even during uh, summer days because it could be 115 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona, 
if you're in a vehicle accident and you're bleeding, you potentially could become hyperthermic. I mean, when you lose blood, you, your core body temperature reduces. So have that as a plan. And and I would say definitely not, not last. There's plenty other options. But as a priority, have the ability to treat first aid as it applies to vehicles. We see a lot of burn victims in vehicles because you're driving a vehicle with a 15-gallon at a minimum fuel tank underneath it. If you're in a vehicle accident and or you come across a vehicle accident where there's a burn victim, not understanding protocols could actually do further harm. For example, putting bandages or putting water on a burn victim is the worst thing you could do. Simply have burn bandages and understand that protocol and have that in your vehicle. Have all the things tethered to first aid. Uh, for example, um, have the ability to SAM splint a wound. Uh, if you break or injure your neck or your extremity, you need to isolate and immobilize because you have to get to a higher level of care. And you're not you typically thinking about that when you're thinking about treating the injury. You have to actually transport the injured to include yourself potentially a long time over whatever kind of conditions that you're at. So have that ability. Um, last, lastly, I, let me fill this gap. It's recovery and maintenance. We ran into this in the back country of Moab. We had, um, we had imagery that showed a route that didn't exist. You know, we adapt. I, I think it was, man, I, I, I'm glad that media wasn't there, but I wish secretly there was like a, a third party filming that entire thing because it could have been a great documentary on the mindset and the technical skill sets of people who are trained because nobody got stressed out. Everybody worked together. We adapted and we did so um, happily. And, and because we're trained, that was just a life experience that was real, really fun. But for most people, they would have fall apart. I mean, some people would just quit, try to start a fire, probably couldn't start a fire, and then try to call SOS and set up the the the, uh, the balloon. Um, be prepared in the backcountry with maintenance and recovery that's going to facilitate your mechanical tool to get out of harm's way if something happens. It could be a, a, a tire flat. I mean, we had a we, we lost the side puncture. We lost a tire, but we, we did a NASCAR pit change and change it in like two minutes and we're back on the road um, and able to continue. If we didn't have that, it would have been a lot more difficult to get out of that situation, but we planned for contingencies and we had the right equipment. How essential do you think Evan's bucket was as far as our survival goes on that particular evolution? <laughs> that bucket, man. I don't. I still. Don't, it's like a mystery. It's like, and I and I want to explain to people what I'm talking about. I'm not using a code word. I am talking about a white five gallon bucket that I assume was sourced at a Ace Hardware or a Home Depot that had about a half a flat of twelve ounce bottles of water stuffed in it. And I didn't even look at what was underneath that, but that was his suitcase for the day. And I just don't have any explanations for it, but we had a bucket. <laughs> I thought there was coffee in it because it had coffee stickers. And Evan's the coffee guy. And yep. there wasn't anything in it, but a whole bunch of crap. And I'm like, and it was taking up all the space when we needed the space when we cross loaded. And I was like, oh, that's unfortunate. Like now we have this bucket to deal with, but, yeah. but we, but we had a crapper. If we needed to poop in it, if we had to fetch water, we had some things. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about all this stuff in the vehicle, whether it be recovery or bandages or treating people, space mylar blankets, I just want to double tap the importance of something that you already brought up. And I don't want to make this a Garmin commercial, but those inreaches, I just got back from a 10 day trip in Costa Rica with my family, which is from a communication perspective, there's very few places there that you're not going to have cell coverage. But my inReach, I carried uh, the fanny pack that you actually gave me for that trip, the gray one that came out. Obviously, the firearm compartment did not have a firearm in it because I don't feel like going into uh, international jail. But in that at all times, it was literally this micro garment inReach. When we were backcountry before uh, you sabotaged the Bronco with your route selection in the attempt to ruin my vehicle, um, <laughs> When that happened, we were not in cell coverage. We were very deep inside of a channelized terrain, but we were immediately able to communicate to people our situation. They started asking for help. We were able to coordinate a pickup at the house that we were able to make our way back to. Um, my wife had already started looking at recovery companies, and all of that was based on a simple device, like you said, that connected to 
the cell phone. And even at worst case scenario, say your cell phone goes down because the batteries on the in reaches are far superior than modern cell phones. That thing has a button where in worst case scenario, you could push it. It is, in my mind, inexcusable for people to do anything where communication may be even a, a consideration without having one of those devices. That ability to communicate enhances all of those things. You have a burn victim and you apply the right treatment, get in touch of a higher level of care and start working towards each other as opposed to trying to work to a place where you have cell service and then you're behind the power curve. It's just, I get that there's a cost to it, but what's the price you're willing to pay for not having one of those things? Yeah, I, I've already committed a long time ago to that membership fee. And I think it's like 14 bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. Well, um, it's variable and you can change it. You can scale it up and down and you can cancel it at the end of every month. It's just, there really are no excuses to not have one. Yeah. I, I wish I w selfishly, I wish I was sponsored by Garmin because I, I love the product so much. M most significantly it's giving you where you're at. It's giving you the imagery of where you need to go. And if you get lost, it has the ability to SOS and to reach out no other devices have that ability, even transponding on RF based communication devices on the universal SOS channel is, is likely not going to be taken seriously as a deliberate protocol to a center that is designed. Like my favorite thing I ever did was when I set up that account, I accidentally didn't, I was kind of fumbling through it, trying to navigate how to use it. And my son picked it up and pushed the SOS button and I said, yes. oh. and I tried to cancel it. <laughs> and then my cell phone rang and it said, Hey, this is Garmin uh, SOS. Did, are, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm actually okay. And thank God. And then I was completely sold, sold on it. And hell, we should have a Garmin sponsorship because it's the best. <laughs> Morning, everybody. As you know, Change Agents is an Ironclad original, but what you may not know is that for over a decade, Ironclad has worked with brands and individuals to create world-class films, series, podcasts, and ad campaigns. In fact, I've been working with Ironclad for the past few years. I was introduced to them on a project through the Navy SEAL Foundation. I've worked with them uh, on a variety of projects, even up here in Montana, long before they proposed the idea of Change Agents to me. They're the best in their field. And I say that because there are plenty of people out there looking for the best, looking for the cream of the crop, looking for the top of the triangle. And if you're looking for that, you need to look no further than Ironclad. If you ever need media by way of film, a series, podcasts, or ad campaigns, they have you covered. You can reach out today and follow them anywhere at This Is Ironclad, the ampersand and then this is Ironclad, or visit them online, thisisironclad.com. Again, www.thisisironclad.com. You know, here's this, uh, a natural disaster situation I don't hear talked about very much, but it's it has to do with water supplies. What do you suggest people do if their water supply is affected, whether it be natural contamination, whatever the contamination may be, or their access to it is shut off? I don't hear people talking about this particular situation much. Yeah, it's it's the greatest question because we understand the rules of threes. You know, this this uh, idea that you can't go with, uh, more than three hours or three hours without, um, what is it? Three hours without, I, I don't even know what the three hours is, the three days without uh, water, uh, 30 days without food. When you look at water, it's very anatomically um, you know, dependent, I would say. You know, some people, like I can't, I can't go a couple hours without water. And when you start deteriorating because you're not hydrated, your cognition obviously is affected. And so water is very important. Here's where pe people get water wrong. They stockpile water. Not to say that's a bad thing. But water as a collected vessel at six plus pounds a gallon takes up a lot of space, right? It takes up a lot of space. What you need to do more importantly is have that and the protocol for capturing water. Blivets and bladders are the best. I mean, uh, don't forget buckets. But you have to have a white bucket with a black rifle coffee <laughs> sticker. Um, it, all these vessels are important. And it's it's funny because I was watching this Leave the World Behind show and movie. And I, I am, I'm like the guy in the tactical movie where I'm preemptively going, why is he not doing this? He needs to do this. And I said, when the character Julia Roberts was uh, talking about what to do next, I said, guys, you need to fill the bathtubs, the sinks, and every vessel, 
every bucket with water. And she literally said that like right after she's like, we need to fill the, the bathtubs with water. Right. And the guy's like, no, we don't need to do that. You need to do that right out the, right out the gate. When your water is shut down, you need to have a stockpile of water. And when you know it's impending that you might run out of water, you need to fill as many vessels and devices that you, or vessels and containers as you have with water. The important part component to water is there's a filtration aspect that most primitive survivalists and products focus on. Filtration is like the easiest part of it. It's sanitization that's the most important part. Protozoa, bacteria, all these viruses that live in water, that's what's going to kill you. In fact, what's going to kill you in every survival circumstance, we know this from um, the whole uh, Christopher Columbus kind of deal, it's going to be the disease it's going to be the virus. It's going to be the bacteria that kills you the quickest. You need to prevent that. And the best way to do it uh, on a large scale is household bleach. Household hmm. bleach, it is, it is ludicrous. The, the hundreds of thousands of gallons that you could sanitize with one big container of household bleach. It's the same concept behind iodine tablets or chlorine dioxide, where you just need a little bit of that to, in order to, to sanitize the water. Now, you still got to purify it. But that process is pretty easy. One of the best products that I found recently that I recommend everybody having, uh, there's some downfalls with it, is the grail system, which is a grail is a container. It's a vessel that you could procure the water. So you have the container mm -hmm. and then you push through the filtering system through the water. And by the time it hits the bottom, because of the way the filter is designed, it purifies and sanitizes everything that's in, in the water. Now, the mm -hmm. downfall is, you have to work from water source to water source. Um, as a recommendation for people in general, contain as much water as you, as you can. What most people forget about water is the consideration for hygiene and for cooking. You need water to cook, to purify, and you need, and you need water to clean your ass. So set that aside because that's actually more water than you need every single day to keep yourself alive. So have an excessive amount of water. I have a 550 gallon container of water uh, behind me. That for my family will last several months. That, you're like, what? 550 gallons? That's, that's a whole lot of water. Yeah, that only lasts a couple months. So what are what are my alternatives? Fresh water sources, um, water that I could tap into. Understand understanding if you have connection to city water or if you have connection to well water. All of those things are, are important to understand. And having a plan to capture, contain, sanitize, and purify are important. I like it. All right. So for people who are watching this and listening to this and they have the realization like, holy shit, I didn't even realize what I don't know. I hadn't even thought about a lot of these situations. I have knowledge gaps or skill gaps that I need to bridge or I want to bridge. Where would you point people? Where can people learn more? The best way is honestly, and I hate to, to plug myself here in this, is the book. I mean, the reason I wrote, prepared a manual for surviving worst case scenarios is because I couldn't find anything that set a protocol and went into the weeds. Yeah, sure, everybody has their, their acronym or, or their concepts and their philosophies, but nobody has like an instruction manual of like, here's how it works and here's some things that you could do. I can't wait to write the revised version. Because like even with our situation in Moab, I learned a lot from that. I want to be able to continue to build that out. But as a base, that that those principles, four intangibles and three tangible principles of preparedness is a good start point. And selfishly plugging myself again because nobody else is doing it, we have a app that is online-based content. And you could download that content and tether it to a device. So in the worst case scenario, when you don't have technology integrated into uh, the internet, you literally could have the offline version of that education. Um, I would say lastly, every single piece of information that you reference, buy the book and, and shelve it. That, the books behind me, which is about a thousand books, are all on survival. And I don't have that because I, I'm, well, I'm a nerd in survival, but I, I have it as a reference because when all the machines shut down and I need to reference basic mechanics, um, water purification, basic protocols and homesteading, those are the books that I'm going to be able to utilize that aren't going away. What would you, I'll let you close it out for our hour because we're coming up to the end of it. Just any closing thoughts that you might have, what would you leave people with just your personal thoughts on preparation? 
arrogance and ignorance will kill the most. Um, most people either are arrogant and or ignorant to the fact that it would happen to them because it currently hasn't happened to them. As we both know, because we work with law enforcement, we, we educate them, we mentor them, we train them. Uh, a, an entire department and institution in law enforcement could change all of its protocols based on one catastrophic officer-involved shooting or trauma. And, and when that happens, it's because we look back and we say, holy crap, why didn't we do that? Why didn't we change that in the first place? And it's because they're not thinking preemptively. They're not thinking in advance and preparing for an uncertain future. So set aside your arrogance and ignorance to the fact and just realize that being prepared replaces this paranoia gap, this lack of confidence gap with confidence and understanding that education is invaluable. And when you need it, you'll have it. And, and it, for you to like go through an experience and hopefully survive and then realize you need it afterwards, I don't want people to be um, set up for failure that way. So just whatever you can do in whatever way, apply preparedness in some way to your life. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. Just do a little bit and then start to build off that. Preparedness, lastly, is not a hobby. I think it's more of a lifestyle. It's a way of life. And sure, it's it could be inconvenient. But if it's if it's convenient and you can integrate it into your life, you're more likely to do it. And that's how you become more prepared. If you enjoyed today's episode and you want to learn more about Mike Glover and Fieldcraft Survival, please visit fieldcraftsurvival.com. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an ironclad original, proudly presented by a Montana knife company. And we are going to be back next week with an all-new episode. See you then. 